Yes, we only have 40 minutes to learn how to manage challenging behavior. <laughs> we'll have to see about that. That means we need to go straight onto the subject. So there's a lot of challenging behaviors. I've been very interested in the concept of challenging behavior, behavior that challenges. My, what do you call it, um, the way to define it I use today is behavior that somebody thinks is a problem. That's what we're talking about. It's not so much about the behavior in itself. So we will have to start somewhere, and we'll actually start in the area of problem solving, because that might be what we would call a challenging behavior. The reason is that most conflicts are actually just two people trying to solve their problems. It often starts with one person having a problem and then solving it, and the sol solution becomes a problem for some other person, and then that person needs to solve that problem, and that solution becomes a problem for the first person. Have you ever been into a conflict yourself? <laughs> Question. You, you did your best, right? It was the other one who was an idiot, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> just the story. Uh, it's about 10 years ago, I got a DVD in my, um, in my, in my mail. Uh, I was going to do some uh, guidance at a place with uh, people with autism and, and quite severe difficulties. Uh, and, and they sent me a, a little film on this DVD because they said, this is difficult. And then everything, the small film started out being dark. And then suddenly a lamp turned on and in comes a person, a woman in about 40 years of age. And she goes in and she turns on the light. And then she says, good morning. And then there's a 17-year-old boy sleeping in a bed. He thinks that her behavior is a problem. I can understand that. He solves the problem. He pulls the blanket over his head. I think that's very smart. Uh, she thinks that's a problem. She solves her problem by taking the blanket and doing like this. Good morning. And he thinks that's a problem. So he takes the blanket and pulls it up over his head again. She thinks that's a problem. So she takes the blanket and takes it away and throws it in the sofa. He thinks that a prop that's a problem. So he stretches out his arm like this and turns off the light. She thinks that's a problem, so she turns on the lights and says, good morning. N then she turns on the light in the hall again also. He goes out in the hall, turns off the light, turns off the light in the bedroom, and goes to bed again. Then she turns on the light in the bathroom, in the hallway, and in the bedroom. <laughs> and he gets up, takes her, you know, in the back here, in her shirt, and just pushes her out of the apartment Locks it, closes the door, locks it, turns off all the lights. Then there's a, a pause of about 40 seconds, and then the door opens, and in comes two youngsters, about 25 years old, boys. Have you ever seen somebody working in a residential facility um, that actually got hired because they had wide shoulders? <laughs> yeah. Two of those. Yeah. And they just sneak into the room, and they stand there. And then the door opens, and this woman comes in, and she starts turning on all the lights, and she's singing, good morning, good morning, good morning. And the boy says, ah, oh, and he gets up, t throws her out of the apartment, closes the door, locks it, turns off all the lights. And then before he's finished with that, the two other guys, they went into his bedroom, took his bed, and then went out the back door. <laughs> yeah. This is a true story. Yeah. I come to this place where I'm going to do some guidance, and they say, you understand we have a problem? And I say, yes. <laughs> well, the thing I don't understand is why the staff wanted me to come and not the boy. <laughs> yeah. And then I, I talk to them, I say, every time you have a solution, it becomes a problem. Every time you solve that problem, it becomes a, solu a problem for him. And then we have what we call a conflict. Uh, that's rising, that's kind of de uh, developing be because of this. And we need to find another way of doing things like this because this actually ended in a very violent situation and we, we don't want that. So what we need to do is that either you or the boy needs to find another way of solving this problem so it doesn't become a problem for somebody else. And the thing about this is, have you ever heard about um, the concept of diplomacy? That's about what we're talking about. Instead of building conflicts, we need to find a way of doing a diplomatic solution to the situation. 
the concept that I'm actually trying to find is, no, it isn't. It, it's the concept of saying, how do we walk together instead of fighting against each other? And then the staff says, aha, can you tell us how we can teach this guy to get, get out of bed without it being, becoming a problem for us? And I say, no. That's not the job. The job is to get him out of bed. It's not to teach him to get out of bed. That's very important. We're talking management today. We're not talking about teaching or learning or anything like that. We're talking management. We need every day to get him out of bed in a good manner. And that means we need to find a solution that's not a problem for him. And we did that. We put in a coffee machine um, in his bedroom, about three yards from his bed. So actually what we do in the morning is that the same woman comes in and she says, good morning. I just put on the, the, the coffee. And she pulls in the water, and she pulls in the coffee, and she turns on the button, and a little lamp that's over by the, the coffee maker. And then she just says, see you in 10 minutes, and she leaves. And then, you know, do you know how coffee machines tend to sound in the beginning? And then there's the smell. And then there's this special sound after seven minutes when the coffee's finished. He doesn't have a chance. <laughs> How many of you needed seven minutes to get out of bed this morning? Uh, how many of you thinks it's easier to get out of bed if there's a smell of coffee? Uh, you understand? What we're actually doing is giving him, giving him a chance to be able to control the situation. And that's a very important thing when we talk about self-control, what we're talking about today. But we actually found a solution for our problem that actually made him get out of bed because that was their job. He was still in school. We needed to get him up every morning, and it was difficult. But we found a way. And the thing is about this, in the first situation, staff tried to take control, and they become, became powerless. In the second situation, the staff tried to get him to control the situation, <laughs> and they didn't become powerless. I think that's quite exciting. And there's a principle in this, and I think that we should we should do a little experiment. This is an interactive talk, okay? There'll be some experiments. This is the first one. I'd like all of you to, to stand up. Can you do that? Can you stand up? Mm. And then we'll set one foot in front of the other. Can you do that, like this? And then can you stay like this? Huh? Can you then take your thumbs on your shoulders like this and then do like this and say, ah! 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 Thank you very much. Sit down, please. And now, I have, a, I have a small question. Did I control you? Was I controlling you? Because I expected you to say that, which is why I didn't get up. You kept your But the rest of you, what's that? Actually, I, I'm, I'm not so sure, so I think we should do another experiment. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, start by taking off all your clothes. Did I control you? No. I didn't do it the first time. I didn't do it the second time. Who controlled you? You did. You were in self-control, right? Because have you ever lost self-control? Can you stand like this if you're not in control? No, of course you can't. If you're not in control, you will hit your head on the ground, and then you'll poop your pants. Thanks. I mean, that's what happens. And that didn't happen. So actually, you were in control. And because of that, you could actually do what I asked you to. And that's very important. This is a principle. You need to be in self-control in order to cooperate with others. That means that if we have a person that we need to cooperate with us, we cannot take control. We need to get him to have self-control in order to make this happen. And then we have this little, what can we say about it? We have a model for this. Uh, this is not my model, it's, it's, it's a lot of other people have used it during the years. Uh, I've done a little bit to it, everybody does. Uh, but it looks like this, effect, intensity, and then time. Have any of you ever been in this situation where you felt the anxiety or anything else go up like this because it was difficult? Of course you have. And then we have the limit, the limit of control. Below the limit, we have self-control. Above the limit, we have chaos. That's not very difficult to understand. This limit is very low on newborn kids. Have you ever seen a two-month-old child become hungry? <laughs> he loses control totally. 
Yeah. And at the age of 35, most of us can actually be hungry without crying. That's very good. <laughs> yeah. But other things happen. Perfectly normal children uh, will, at the age of one, cry if mom says, no! But if she says, no, at the age of two, he'll just say, hmm. <laughs> yeah. We call that affect regulation. And that's very good. I think that most of you have a limit that's up here, right? I have. When, I come, when, when, I, when, I'm into, in, when I'm in a situation that's quite difficult, I often just say, we'll manage. But what about the people with autism you're working with or parenting? Where are their limits? It's a lot lower, right? That means that when they come into a difficult situation, they will not say, I'll manage. They'll say, oh, this is, this is going to end really badly. In a, just a minute, I will get to the limit, and then I'll start hitting my head in the ground, and I don't want to. And then they will start doing things. They'll have strategies. And you, you had a very good strategy just a, while, a little while ago. What actually happened was that um, I asked you to stand like this, and you manage very nicely. And then I asked you to take off all your clothes. And then I think you thought, that's not a very good idea. <laughs> and I also think you th that you thought, I'm not sure that I can, I'm not really sure that I can predict what's going to happen if I take off all my clothes in this situation. Yeah. My central coherence is not big enough to make that decision. <laughs> so because of that, you actually chose an act. What did you do? You refused while you were laughing me right up in my face. <laughs> we call it the Gandhi strategy. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it, it's what we call non-violent strategy, right? It was very, very good. And there's a lot of those. Refusing is one. Lying. Have ever, any one of you ever lied in order to avoid a difficult situation? <laughs> mm? My wife got a haircut, and I came home, and she was sitting in the kitchen, and I don't like changes. I'm 50 years old. I don't like changes. And she says, what do you think? There is only one, only one right answer to that question. Right? Yes. Mm -mm. There's a beautiful dissertation by uh, a, a person called Pia Jasma uh, at the University of Linköping in Sweden. Uh, he wrote a beautiful, beautiful article. He's an ethicist, and it, it's called Living the Categorical, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, Imperative on Lying in Autism, I think it's called. He says, we actually have a... We have, a, we have a, a task we need to teach people with autism to lie because things go wrong when they don't lie and things go wrong when they, when they lie badly. <laughs> and it's an empathy thing. So training people to lie properly will actually help them socially. I think it's a beautiful work. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Running away, have any of you ever thought, I better go now? <laughs> yeah. It's a very good thing. And sometimes, have you ever said to, to somebody, say, come here, and he thought, I better go now. And he started walking away, and you went after him. And then you could be spit at or, or hit. I was hit. I was actually, I was working in, in, in Ireland with Andy McDonald, if anybody ever heard of him. I think he's here somewhere. Um, and we were in this house where this woman with autism lived. Um, and we went in there, and I just opened the door and went in uh, because we were seeing how she was living. And she came out of the bathroom, and she saw me in my hat standing in her living room, and she went up to me and hit me three times in, in my head, in my face. Then I went out in the hallway, and she sat down and ate her uh, uh, sandwich. Uh, I think that was very nice of her. Uh, but why, she, why did she do this? She did it because it was a very, very good strategy to get strangers to leave your living room. Yeah. And it was absolutely disrespectful of me to walk into her apartment like that. I shouldn't have done that. I realized that at the moment she hit me. <laughs> but she did the right thing. I think it was beautiful. And we have these threats. Have you, have you ever threatened anybody saying, if you don't stop, I'll, I'll just go away. I'll leave then. Was it because you wanted to stay or because you wanted to leave? It was because you wanted to stay. So when somebody says, stop that or I'll hit you, it's not because they want to hit you. It's because they don't want to hit you. It's a nonviolent solution. It's a very smart solution. <laughs> and for some people, it's their only solution. And, and then we need to manage that. But we need to manage it, and that's very important. I'm a neuropsychologist. I've done parental 
uh, what do you call it, uh, parental uh, uh, assessments, seeing can you actually manage your child. Uh, some of the people I've been assessing were members of the banditos. Yeah. Do I get threats? Yes. Is that a problem? No. Why not? Because I just say, you don't have to threaten me. I will not leave this report to anybody before you think it's a good report. Because that's my job anyways, right? So it doesn't matter. But we need to, I need to motivate him to do the changes. And when I do that, I'm, I'm not afraid of his threats. Because threats are not, they're not dangerous. That's very important. We have biting one's hand. That's, that's a good way to manage a difficult situation. Some of us even bite our fingers. Maybe even the lips. Have you ever met, met, met anybody who bit like this in stressful situations? Very smart. Yeah. And of course, bad names. I think bad names is one of the most amazing things. Somebody calling you an idiot or something like that. I think it's, it's so beautiful. Have anybody of you ever called somebody a bad name, somebody you, re you really liked? <laughs> yeah. And I think it was actually in a situation where you were two equals. And then one started deciding over the other one. And then you said, idiot. And then he said, I'm sorry, I'm not the one to decide over you. We equals. Or he said, you're an idiot too. And then you're also equals, two idiots. <laughs> so what he was actually doing was he was trying to get this, you, you were trying to get this e equality reestablished. But what if, if we work in the autism field or if we are parents, we're not equal. We start here. And if somebody calls you an idiot, that's quite logic, isn't it? It's a good thing, because he's just trying to see, is this power holding up, or can I actually equalize it? And, and it's not a problem. I mean, I live in a country where we have freedom of speech. You're allowed to call your mom or your staff an idiot. It's a democratic right, and it might be the only democratic right he will be using for many, many years. So I think we, we just say, yeah, you might, that, that you might think, but we're doing like this at the moment. And, and often it just works. Because what you, authority is something you get, it's not something you take. That's very important. And what happens if these strategies work? Then just poof, we manage below the limit. I think that's beautiful. We are going to look for 20 minutes at how to do this, how to help this, because we have some aims. Um, the aims are, one, to make sure the person keeps his or her self-control, two, to help the person regain self-control if it's he or her has lost it, and also to help the person cooperate when they are in, in self-control. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to do it in, a, in a looking at the tools of our trade. I, I'm very interested in old cars and also tools, of course. And I figured out something. I have a lot of toolboxes at home. I have one in the garage, I have one in the house, I have one in the garden. They have different tools in them for different situations. And we need that too. We need some tools that's about managing. How do I manage this? That's what we're talking about today. Then we need tools for assessment, evaluating what went wrong. And then we need tools for the change. How do we change this situation so it won't happen again? But one thing I think is very important is that we don't mix the toolboxes. What we're talking about today is managing. We're not talking about learning. That's very important. Learning is in the change toolbox. So what we're doing, managing, it's, it's not important. Learning is not important. It's important to manage this in a good way without escalating the situation. And that's what we're talking about. That's, uh, I, I get a question sometimes. I think it's quite a funny question. Staff says, we're not really on the same level in our staff group. And I say, what do you mean? Yes, we have a question. If Peter's throwing the furniture around, who's going to clean it up? And I say, do you actually mean that you need a psychologist to answer that question for you? <laughs> I mean, here we have staff who gets paid and a person with autism who doesn't get paid. How come you can think that you shouldn't? Of course you should clean up. You're the one who's getting paid. You're also absolutely the best one at cleaning up, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. There's absolutely no reason we should take the person who doesn't get paid and who, and who actually has skill problems in a, lot of, in a lot of areas, why should we ask him to clean up? And they say, but then he doesn't learn. No, now you're using the wrong toolbox. There's no learning in that. If you think that somebody stops throwing furniture because he needs to raise the chairs, you probably never threw a chair yourself because that might be the worst situation this month in his life, uh, throwing the chair and cleaning it up won't matter. But we, 
we clean up because we are managing in a good way. It's about these difficult. We're going to talk about the management today, managing the behavior, because that's what I'm here to talk about. It's just as simple as that. When we do that, we need some concepts in order to get these tools to work. And one concept is what we call affect contagion. This is a concept, it actually, do you ever hear about a, a person called Sigmund Freud? Uh, he was talking about this as uh, transference and counter-transference and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm not a Freudian. Um, but then there was another psychologist called Sylvan Tompkins, who in the 60s uh, actually brought this other explanation. Uh, he said, it, it's, it's quite simple. He says, affect is contagious. We can feel other people's feelings. And maybe we cannot realize we're feeling it, but they, we, sometimes we get their feelings as well. And we know from Rizzolazzi's work in the 90s that it's probably about mirror neuron, neurons. I, I, I read all these mirror neuron research in, in the 90s, and he, he talked about autism. I said, that's bullshit. Sorry, it, it really is. I couldn't understand it. But his initial research was very fine. It was when he tried to talk about autism. It, it, something bad happened, I think. Um, but actually, what, we are all mirroring each other. And that's the, the real thing he actually figured out. Uh, have you ever sit, been sitting opposite somebody who was yawning? Yeah. Was there a mirroring effect? Yeah. Somebody smiling at you in the bus, and you become a little more happy? That's very nice. Have you ever talked on the phone to somebody who was depressed? Yeah. You get like this, right? So of course, there's some mirroring involved in this. And we will experiment a little bit with that. Uh, we start with a simple uh, experiment. This is a picture. It's um, from Charles Darwin's book, The Expression of Emotion, from the 1870s. Um, this is a nice girl, isn't it? We get a little, when we look at that, we become a little, mm, oh, that's it's quite nice. She's got a friend. <laughs> Why are you laughing? You're laughing because something happened. You got, you got a contagion situation, and, and that, then you got a feeling, and that feeling you didn't want, the feeling of disgust, and when we have a feeling we don't want, we start laughing <laughs> to get it out. Um, <laughs> have you ever been in a situation that was embarrassing? <laughs> yeah. so that's, that's, that's the thing. Um, what I want you to do now is we do this experiment again, but without laughing. Try to feel what's happening physically. We start with this nice woman, and then we look at her friend, and something happens in your stomach, right? It's about blood flow, it's about tension, it's about hormones, but something is actually happening. And I think that's very, very exciting because it's happening in everyone all over the world from the moment they're born. Uh, even people who later on get diagnosed with autism have these problems from the, not problems, have this ability from the beginning. Then some people actually have a little problems in the empathy development. And one of the things that might happen there is that it seems like in the research we have now that it might be like some people, doesn't, some people don't develop the ability to know which person is having this effect. Have you ever seen a child of a 10, year, 10 month old sitting and another child sitting and the first one starts crying and the second one says, somebody is, somebody is sad and I think it's me. That's, that's normal development. When you do the same thing when you're 14, that's not normal. Uh, and, and then we might diagnose it with something. But it's still the same thing happening. Uh, we have beautiful work by Lombardi and colleagues in Cambridge that were looking at what's actually happening in thinking of me and thinking of another. And they realized that people with Asperger syndrome were using the same area in their brain when they were thinking about themselves and when they were thinking about Queen Elizabeth. While people without Asperger syndrome had two different areas. But the people with autism were thinking with the Queen Elizabeth area all the time. And that means they might look at each other from the outside. I do not have Asperger's syndrome. It's very difficult for me to understand how that might feel, how that might be perceived. Have you ever come across Damien Milton's work on... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I love Damien. I know Damien. He's, it's very nice work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but what does this mean? Yeah, it means that if you have a feeling the person you're working with, the child you're with, if you're a parent, will have the same feeling as you have. And that's not a problem if you're glad or happy and he's glad or happy, but it's a problem if you press him above the limit 
that he has a little lower than you. Have you ever played with a three-year-old and it, it became just a little bit too funny for him? Yeah. And it happens all the time. Have you ever screamed at a person with autism and you got a receipt immediately? Yeah. And that's what happened. So what do we need to do? In able to, in, to be able to manage behavior problems and behavior systems, we need to have some skills and some methods to use. And we get back to this model, and then we start to say, what do we do before it happens, what we do in the chaos situation, and what do we do afterwards? And we will do that in almost in 13 minutes. Then it's finished this, OK? Isn't it nice to know 13 minutes? I don't, yeah, I like that. What do we do in the beginning when, when things haven't gone off rail yet? Uh, first, we need to keep calm. And that's very easy to say. I don't know in, in English, I don't know in your language, but where I live, we have a very nice expression. Um, it's in dialect, it says, it, it, we, we talk like this to say, Lunadai. <laughs> no. It means, calm down, please. There is no words that work as bad as those, right? They just never work. Um, so sometimes we need tools to do that. And one of the tools are to avoid prolonged eye contact. Experiment. Eye contact, two sec 10 seconds, two and two. Anybody who dares. The ones who have a problem with eye contact, of course you don't have to do it. But the rest, try this out. It's quite exciting. You look, I count. Two and two. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And I think you realized that it wasn't that easy. What happened? You started to look another person in the eye, and it was okay for two and a half seconds, right? Then one of you got a small effective outburst, like, ah. yeah. <laughs> And when that happened to the first one, the other one got two, and then you get one. Oh. And then you started managing. How many of you used an effective management system called the smile? Yeah. And how many of you had to move it to a cognitive management system, the, the, the system of language? Yeah. So you had to manage. What would have happened is if this was a situation where you were angry and the other person didn't know who was angry? It would be very violent. So you never say, look at me while I'm talking to you. because. It's not very good. It will actually counter, uh, it, it'll be counterproductive in this situation. Also, we need to think about how we speak. Uh, I don't know about you, but I think most of you, you're not used to sitting down full days, are you? You do work when you walk around and stuff like that. And we're in a, in a room, it's nice weather outside, there's no windows. It's a little dark in here. So, does anybody of you ever sleep in front of the telly? Yeah. So what's happening? Um, in this situation, I need you to be awake. There, there were research in the 60s trying to figure out, do people learn when they're sleeping? And they figured out that no, they're not learning when they're sleeping. <laughs> and we're here to learn, so we need to keep you awake, right? Um, and, and I have some tools for that. And of course, it's mirror neuron tools. One of them I'm using is two muscles I have around here. I could, I could talk without using those muscles. It would sound like this if I would have talked like this. Even 40 minutes would be difficult to keep awake in, wouldn't it? But if you want somebody to calm down, it's a very nice way of doing it. But if you want somebody to stay awake, you do like this, right? It's not, it's not very difficult. It's about uh, hormones in your blood and stuff like that. So, so it's easy. And then sometimes I, I even hear, uh, though I, I hear staff saying, but I, I was very calm and he hit me anyway. And I say, what did you say? And then they say, I said like this, put on your shoes. <laughs> I can be very calm, but when I'm using my jaws like this, it, it seems a little bit aggressive, right? Right now, I'm not angry. I'm just, I'm just pressing my, cheek, my, my jaws together, and it gets a quite aggressive mirror neuron experience for you, right? So, of course, we try to talk like this with an open mouth if we want it to be calm. And then we use diversions to get the person to think about something else. Diversions is it's not learning. And of course, it's not learning. We're managing. Diversions is getting the situation to work. So it doesn't matter if you get people to laugh or if you give them a piece of gum or something else to kind of divert the situation if it's on its way up. And then we need to keep the distance. 
We talked about it before this. I say, now it's time for me to walk away. You've all been in situations like this. And you say, come here to the person. And he says, now I'm walking away. And he walks away. And you walk after him. Uh, and of course, he will start running. That's just how it is. But if you do like this instead, he will probably stop and stay at what his safe distance would be. And it would be around two yards. If you're walking after him, it'll be 20 yards, right? Yeah. So just by walking the other way, that's quite a good, it's quite a good uh, way of doing it. Also, when we place demands, we normally do like this. Put on your shoes. So we walk up to the person. Have you ever been sleeping in a bed and somebody comes up to you and say, time to get up. I just stay here until you get out of bed. <laughs> Is it easy to get out of bed in that situation? No. You want him to walk away. So what you do every time you place a demand, you step backwards in order to whew, get the person's self-control in, 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 in play. That's very important. And then we don't stand opposite the person. Have you ever seen a man going up to another man do like this? Huh? <laughs> when we see that in Copenhagen, where I lived for some years, it was normally it would be British football supporters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But have you ever seen, that, that's another way of doing it too, have you ever seen somebody do like this? I say, ah, how? <laughs> Why do we stand opposite when we want to kiss or hit somebody? It's because we are communicating effective instead of cognitive. So what, when you actually want to communicate in language, of course you stand like this, because that's what you do when you're talking. Never do like this, because now he needs to understand, because what you're doing is changing the communication into the effective realm, and then it actually means that he needs to understand who has the effect, effect in the situation. And then we need to sit down when the person is agitated. Uh, today we've been doing it, uh, I've been standing and you've been sitting, because that's, that's quite a good way of doing a situation like this. Uh, if we had a situation where you were standing and I was sitting, it would be a very difficult lecture to do. Uh, but we could have been sitting, all of us. I'm very good at sitting. Um, if, we have been, if I've been sitting like this and talking just for 40 minutes, it would still be a bit more difficult to stay awake, right? But then I see staff, they're sitting like this, and then they say, oh, Peter's getting agitated. I better stand up then to calm down the situation. <laughs> Isn't it strange? Yeah. Another thing, I train people. I, I work in forensic psychiatry. I work in, 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 in places for people with severe challenging behavior. And something I'm, one thing I'm teaching them is actually standing like this. Because if you're standing like this, nobody will hit you. But what staff normally does is that when, when they're afraid somebody will hit them, they do like this. Yeah. And of course somebody will hit them. So avoid the marked body language. Think about this. Have you ever been at the pub on a Saturday night? When the pub closes down, you walk through town, and then somebody comes again, uh, towards you, and they're just a bit too tall, just a bit too short-haired. Just one tattoo too many. Have you seen those people? Yeah. What do you do in that kind of situation? Do you do like this? Huh? <laughs> no, you don't. So what do we do when peace is getting agitated? We pretend walking home from the pub, right? Yeah. Because then we won't be infected by his tension, and we might even be able to infect him with our calm. This was the first level. We will go on to the chaos face as well, because of course we need to know what to do there. Uh, the first thing we need to do when we get there is to actually realize, is this a dangerous situation or isn't it? Because I, re I sometimes see that people are doing quite dangerous things in situations that are not very dangerous. One question. How many of you have been in a room where somebody was throwing a chair? Yeah. Good. Um, I have looked through the literature. I have found zero documented cases of somebody dying because somebody with autism threw a chair. <laughs> Just so you know it. I've been through the literature and I've found many, many, many restraint-related deaths. So of course we do not restraint people because they are throwing a chair. It's just too dangerous to do that. So what do we do when people are throwing a chair? Well, we just, we just wait. Because people will never throw a chair for a very long time. Um, 
my, my experience, it's about seven minutes is the longest. A lot of people, it's just 30 seconds. It, it's not that difficult. It's just the waiting. That's there. And somebody says it, it might become a lot more exp uh, expensive. No. We actually have an Iris uh, project. Uh, Martin Goldman was talking about this at a conference in Malta in 2007. And he realized that letting people throw the chair, the, the cost would rise with 10% in the first two months, and then would, would go down and disappear in nine months. <laughs> yeah. Because when people throw the chair and then they calm themselves, they are training calming themselves. I realized something some years ago. You will not become a better runner by buying new running clothes. You actually have to run to become a better runner. <laughs> and if we want the person to be able to be better at calming himself, we need him to start calming himself. If we start continue calming him, he'll actually not become a better in, in calming himself. So we let him throw the chairs till he's finished. That's the best way. And sometimes we need to take out other people, but there's no reason other people are in there when that's happening. So instead of concentrating on him, we concentrate on getting the other ones out. And then we need to avoid touch with tense muscles. Yes. Small experiment, two and two people. The first one does like this, the other one like this. Can you do that? Between the elbow and the, the what do you call it? I don't know, the hand. Yeah. And then we do like this, the one who's holding out his hand, you do like this, oh, tense, 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 tense. Question, what did the other person do? You did like this? For no reason. Why did you do that? It was because you, it was a mirror neuron process. You actually got a little agitated by this muscle tension. So you did like this. Question, has any of you ever had a conflict with a person who was totally calm? <laughs> Doesn't work. So actually, we need the person to not become agitated. We need him to be calm. Tense is not very good. So how do we do that? Yeah, for one thing, we avoid touch and we relax if someone grabs you. Small experiment, left arm, do like this. Right arm, take a tight grip up here. And then you just sit there and feel what's happening. And right about now, the milk acid in your fingers will become quite difficult. It, it's actually, you need to concentrate, right? But then try to do like this and you don't need to concentrate anymore. And then we relax again, and the right hand will need to be concentrated on again, right? So it's easy to hold on to a tight muscle. It's very difficult to hold on to a, a muscle that's not tight. So people will normally let go just by the relaxing. And if, if you need to get out, you still need to relax in order to get free. We have methods for how to, how to get three free and the ones that work involve very, very relaxed muscles. And then, of course, in some situations, we need to grab somebody because they're hitting somebody else or something like that. And in that, we also use the same principles. And the first principle is you need to use the person's own movement. Um, two, three small experiments. The first one, one person does like this, the other one does like this. Two people, can you do that? And then the first one starts hitting in the air like this, and the other one tries to stop him. And you realize it's quite difficult, isn't it? Yeah. So then we try something else. Same starting point. The first one starts hitting. The other one just goes along. Yeah. And now the other one pulls it up a little higher. <laughs> try to do like this. And then you sh And what happens? You just realize it's easier to move somebody when you move with them than if you move against them, right? So what do we do when Peter is hitting Mark like this? Yeah, we need, we need, of course, we need to make sure he's not hitting Mark. So put a hand on his shoulder, put it down, make sure he doesn't hit it. And then when he goes up, you can just lift him away. And then you let go, because that's something that's very funny. And we should try that in an experiment as well. Two and two. The first one starts hitting. The other one tries to stop him, and it's a bit difficult. And then you start, just, I'll just go along. And then let go. And the ones that were let go now, you sit like this. What happened? <laughs> Did you feel the tension go because you were let go? I think it's very important. We do not hold people till they become uh, calm. We let go of people so they become calm. That's very, very important. And it's fast. 
three, four, five seconds is absolutely the best in situations like this. These are principles. If you work with a severe violent people, of course you need to train this. And, and yeah, I, I work with Studio 3, I think that's the best method of, of doing that. So you need, to know, you need to know what you're doing. But if it's just a little here, a little there, these are the principles that we use. And then, of course, avoid pain. There's no use in having pain in this situation. And then, fast, one minute left. What do we do to get down on the other side? We stay calm. We tidy, we tidy up. It's very, easy, it's very important. We tidy up because otherwise we might escalate again. Sometimes we might even divert onwards. Sometimes we go out, start boiling some hot chocolate because then the person will become hot chocolate. Okay, situation is over. Sit down, have the hot chocolate. And then hot chocolate, there's some equality in hot chocolate. The, the quality is the person who's drinking it decides how long time we're sitting. So we actually, he controls the situation by how fast he's drinking the chocolate. When he's ready, we're finished. And then some of my colleagues said, ah, you can't do that. You can't give people chocolate when they're throwing chairs. <laughs> of course we can. Because he didn't throw it. We, we're not teaching him anything. He's not learning anything. He threw a chair because that was the best he could do in the situation. And what we need to do in order to make this work, we need to evaluate in order to change and change so it won't happen again. That's very important. We go back, we make the changes so he doesn't have to throw chairs once more. Thank you very much.